Hello, everyone, and welcome to Keep Simplify. Uh, my name is Sayam Pathak, and you are watching today one of the very interesting workshops and topics that we'll dive into, which is all about confidential computing and confidential containers. Uh, another thing is, uh, before we get started, one of the prerequisite is that you should be aware, you, you should have the basic familiarity with Docker and Kubernetes, like the containers, what containers are, how they work, and Kubernetes and stuff. Um, that will give you most out of this particular workshop. Uh, this is going to be definitely a hands-on workshop. Uh, there is already a GitHub link available with all the stuff that we'll be discussing today. So, uh, so and would very delighted to have uh, Moritz with us today for diving into the world of confidential computing, confidential containers, how you run it on Kubernetes. Uh, he's currently working as a chief architect on the engineering side at Edgeless Systems. They are highly into the confidential computing uh, area. And his he has, uh, like, they have a lot in the confidential computing space. Obviously, uh, Moritz will cover a lot of things, a lot of different conferences, different organizations. Um, the use cases. So, so what we'll do is, uh, before I let uh, Moritz introduce himself in a in a detailed way as well. Uh, so today's kind of agenda would be that we will be diving into confidential computers, confidential computing, the basics. So there'll be the basics, like what it is, what the definition is, what the terminology means, because we have to dive in from scratch. Uh, so we are thinking we are only the only assumption is that you know containers and Kubernetes. Apart from it, the words, the jargons. Uh, the foundations, everything will be kind of covered. The hardware as well, like what all hardwares are available where you can actually do confidential computing, um, what all cloud offerings are there where you get things out of the box um, as of today. And then we dive, we go the step further into the confidential containers, which is the COCO project. So we'll go into the confidential containers, uh, Kata containers, and then the runtime class operator, how to you know use the low level Kata containers. And then we'll be creating uh, Coco capable Kubernetes cluster. Now this is uh, definitely very, very interesting because a Coco operator, a Coco capable Kubernetes cluster is something which will give you a deeper understanding and the practical use case of how things would work. And then in the end uh, would be a fairly new open source project to do this in an easy way, uh, which is deploy confidential containers with uh, contrast. So it is basically um, an easy way, you can say, to deploy and manage the confidential containers on Kubernetes. So that would be the kind of agenda. And um, I would like to introduce uh, Moritz. So Moritz, please feel free to give a detailed introduction. <laughs> Happy to be here. Um, as you already said, uh, my name is Moritz. Um, yeah, I'm. Um, I have a technical background. I, I, I studied computer science. I uh, got very much into into security. Um, actually, a lot of like software binary binary security. Spent a fairly bit of bond of my lifetime uh, playing capture the flag competitions. Maybe some of you are familiar with that. Um, so really, in this, this offensive security and. Uh, yeah, the first time I actually got into touch with this, this topic that's nowadays called confidential computing was during my, my bachelor thesis. I uh, um, yeah, was, was looking at uh, pretty much the first generation of hardware that, that had confidential computing features. And we, we did some uh, exploration in terms of side channel attacks and all this kind of fancy stuff. Um, but that was the first time. And then uh, for, for a couple of years, uh, didn't have any uh, interaction with, with confidential computing at all. Uh, continued my, my path more into the, the research area. And then by coincidence, um, yeah, I, I got in touch with the, the, the two founders of, of Azure Systems. Um, and uh, yeah, was really interested into, into what they were onto um, and, and joined them pretty much as the, the first employee. Um, yeah, almost four years back now. Um, when uh, yeah, Edge System was founded, and since then, uh, yeah, as you said, during my day job, I work uh, mostly on 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 confidential computing. Um, as you can imagine, working in a startup, it's not all only about the technology. There's a lot of things you need to do to work on, um, such as joining workshops <laughs> and 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 spreading the word. Um, but yeah, um, I 
it's 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 feeling weird to saying that I'm, a, I'm an expert, but I guess uh, in a, in a general term, yeah, I'm an expert on on confidential computing, um, even though I don't know all the things. Um, but yeah, very very happy to to give a um, an introduction today, and also this this um, um, when I joined Azure Systems, this whole cloud native Kubernetes space was was fairly new to me, right? Uh, since I was focusing very much on security beforehand and not really into distributed systems cloud uh, kubernetes any kind of these things i mean use them for some things but not really really deep um so this was all new for me um and yeah working on this also for for almost four years now and those two worlds uh bringing them together is is, is pretty much my, my my focus these days so yeah great place to be here um and 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 happy to to get people started uh and uh yeah, give an introduction to to confidential computing. Awesome. So, uh, so yeah, Moritz, uh, let's let's start with the initial introduction. Like, what what can we learn about confidential computing? What it is? Can Ab can you explain us like what confidential computing is? Abs absolutely. And, and yeah, I would I would like to start very very much with the with the with the basics, which is um um not really not really how and 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 uh the, the the tech behind it but really why we're doing this in the first place and and what's really the the concept behind confidential computing um and i like to use this very simple graphic uh which is the fundamental problem that we like to solve with confidential computing which is how can we protect code and data right an application in a potentially or in an untrusted potentially hostile environment right um and this untrusted environment um that could be anything right that could be the cloud that could be some um data center somewhere um this could even be your own computer if uh, the software is not coming from you, but it's coming from some other party that ships that software to you, and it does want, doesn't want you to, to access the software. So this is a very abstract concept, but the idea is the same, that we want to protect an application from its surrounding environment. And this is a fairly, <clears throat> um, I would say, new concept in the sense that so far, there were no really technical means to do so. Essentially, you could protect things while they're on the move, right? If you send something over the network nowadays, you can even join your, your Starbucks uh, Wi-Fi because you're using TLS and you're encrypting all of the network connections. Yeah, you, you're not as vulnerable as you used to be in the past uh, because we have network encryption, we have uh, transport layer security, we have HTTPS, we have this green lock in your browser, depending on what abstraction level you want to go, right? We protect, our, we protect the network and we have the same for 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 storage um if you have an iphone if you have any other kind of uh, android phone you probably have some form of encrypting the 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 um the the integrated uh storage in there so that even though somebody might physically have access to this phone if they don't if they're not able to break the authentication method, may, may be face ID or your pin code, they will not probably be able to, to, to access the data. But as soon as we are, uh, if we're talking about the, the in use, right, the, the uh, while things are running, if you have an application, um, you run it in the cloud or you run it on, on, your, on your friend's computer, essentially there's nothing that protects you from this system having access to to your your application this is the fundamental problem we'd like to solve can we do this can we do find a way to protect our stuff while uh while it's in use while it's operating that's the the, the really fundamental idea we, we're, we're working with here um and interestingly uh initially what people had in mind um when when they thought about this was not directly cloud i mean it was probably already on the radar but it was more for DMA, um, for um, protecting uh, things such as a, a shipping a, a game or a video or a, like a movie, right, to your computer. How can we protect you from stealing that? Like, uh, I'm not sure what the English term for this is, like this um, 
um, copyright infringement, I guess, right? Can we somehow protect stuff that we ship to you? That's, that was part of the initial idea of, of building this technology, but somehow this really didn't 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 um, um, lift off. And instead, people noticed, well, we can use this for something else, which is cloud computing. Because with cloud computing, we have precisely this problem that we have a potentially untrusted environment. We have some shared infrastructure that's owned by a third party. Um, and that is used by millions of users in parallel, which might break out of their confinement and stuff. So we have a really untrusted environment. So there we can really change the trust model. And, and um, this led to the idea of what that confidential computing is, is, is defining uh, nowadays. Because there are different ways of how we can achieve this. Uh, one, is, one is, and I listed this also part of the... Um, what part of our uh, reading here, there are other solutions that go in, in a similar direction. One would be like homomorphic encryption or fully homomorphic encryption. Um, that's when you encrypt data and you actually operate on the encrypted data, right? This is very interesting concept um, because as long as you can operate on encrypted data and you receive the same results once you decrypt them, um, there's really not much more you need to do since um, encrypted data is considered like being right anonymous and being uh, um, keeping the confidentiality of the state intact. Uh, if you are able to achieve this, uh, you don't need much more uh, in terms of protecting that data. Unfortunately, with homomorphic encryption, um, we yet haven't discovered algorithms or have developed algorithms that are performant enough. Right? If you if you run an operation and you run it with fully homomorphic encryption. It will be a thousand or more times slower than it would you run it in, in native speed, which is not feasible um, for practical use cases so far. But there are different ways you can achieve this, right? And and um, the idea of confidential computing is really: can we create some sort of a, like a, a safe space in the cloud? As an example, right? It doesn't necessarily need to be cloud, but let's focus on this cloud use case for the workshop. Can we create some sort of like a safe space in the cloud? Where we are isolated against the rest of the um, this whole infrastructure, and I think somebody recently made the analogy that um, the cloud is somewhat of like a, a, a an apartment you you rent in a in a house um, where you do a contract with the owner um, or the landlord, and you get a key and you have access to that to that apartment and. Your landlord probably also has a key to that apartment, and legally they are not allowed to enter this apartment, um, and they probably won't, and they probably shouldn't, but they could, right? And they could also be somebody that steals that key from them, or they lose this key, and somebody uses that key to access your apartment. Whereas with confidential computing, we want to create more of like an embassy in a foreign country, where right? You have full control over who accesses your embassy and who doesn't. And there's no like landlord in this concept anymore that's owning that property. And you're just a, 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 a renter in that sense. I mean, it's an analogy. It's probably not fully matches this picture, but I think it gets you some idea of what the idea behind confidential computing is. And another aspect of confidential computing in terms, in, in, in contrast to homomorphic encryption is that we want, want or we are solving this um, on a hardware level. So instead of finding an algorithmic, an algorithmic way or a new type of encryption, as we do with uh, homomorphic encryption, we extend the hardware that everything is based on. We extend this hardware to provide us with this safe space, with this embassy. And we do so. Um, uh, and now we get more into the, the, the practice and let, let uh, less in the theoretical space is by um, extending the capabilities of our uh, processor of our CPU um, with additional instructions to create a um, an, an isolated and encrypted space for our applications. And depending on the language, this space is sometimes called a trusted execution environment, short TEE, or an enclave. I think you mentioned that term before, Sam. Um, whatever you want to call it, in, this, in the end, um, it's an isolated space that the processor guarantees us that this space is, 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 is just for us and the application we want to run inside. And nothing else 
can access this this isolated space, right? And um, this already defines two properties of this or three properties. One is it's it 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 ha needs to have a hardware trust anchor. It needs to be hardware based. Uh, at least that's um, how confidential computing is is defined uh, uh, these days, and I'll get to the definition in a second. Um, and that it ensures that this um, this confidential computing environment, this this enclave, right, whatever you want to call it, is encrypted. It's runtime encrypted, meaning there's encryption happening on the on the memory. Um, that it's isolated, meaning that nobody uh, can access uh, this this application while it's running inside the safe space. And the third property, and we will get into more details in, in a second because this is probably the most tricky part to wrap your head around, is that you can actually verify this from remote. So that me as with my local laptop sitting here in my apartment, I can verify that this environment actually exists inside uh, the cloud, inside Microsoft Azure or Google Cloud or wherever, and that it's actually um, correctly um, implementing this other properties and that it actually um, is running the code that I was expecting to be running there. So this form of remotely verifying, and this is then called remote attestation, um, is a is 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 a very important and probably the most important feature of this, um, and probably also the, mo the 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 toughest one to to really wrap your head around about the implications. So these three properties, right? Isolation, runtime encryption, and attestation, which are provided by hardware. Uh, in practice, meaning the processor has an extension, usually we call this an instruction set extension, um, to have some additional commands. We can tell the processor, please create me this environment, please load this application, and ensure that nothing else can access this application, other um, or no other process can access this memory space of the application other than the application itself. And this, in very rough terms, is what we understand from confidential computing. And, the, and if you want to talk about the, um, the security model, what this ensures is the confidentiality and integrity of this application, its code, and its data um, during its, its, its lifetime while it's running. Um, let me go one step deeper into confidential computing. Um, when we talk about this, I, I just explained this on a more conceptual point of view. Um, but if we actually talk about this in practice, and as, and as I said, it has this, this hardware aspect to it. So the hardware has these features. Um, um, I included some links about the actual hardware and the actual processors uh, or, or um, um, uh, other, other kind of processors that provide these, these capabilities. And the the first one that actually to some extent coined this technology was intel uh when they introduced the secure guard extension called sgx um and this was i think back in uh i believe 2015 was the the when they uh the first chips with sgx were actually available i'm not sure when they when they announced it um nevertheless uh let me let me jump back to the slides what what actual what the what SGX provided you with was an instruction set extension or still provides you with uh, is an instruction set extension um, to isolate a single process in uh, your system. So if you have a regular just any kind of uh, Linux could also be Windows system, um, and uh, you could tell the the processor there were some instructions, right? You could tell the processor to isolate your your single process. And um, the and you 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 asked about the limitations and the, the let's say the the problem of this approach, since you isolate a a, a a an individual process and the design that SGX took on this route, um, it meant and I don't want to go into all the details so to lose us here, but what it meant in the end was that you cannot just take any application and just tell a processor. Hey, uh, please run inside an SGX enclave. Instead, this application would actually need to be aware that it runs in an SGX enclave because it didn't have the same system interface. It did. It could not just run as it would run on 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 the regular operating system. So this meant, um, to, in, in 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 long story short, this meant that you would need to adapt your application to run inside SGX. 
So if we talk about usual cloud native workflow, right? You write your application in, in any kind of language um, and you package it inside a, a container. Um, this would mean you need to adapt your source code or you would need to add a lot of uh, glue code in terms of frameworks that you put underneath your application and that you package together inside your container to run, for example, on, on Kubernetes, which for some application can make sense. But for the most part, it was not uh, as easy to adopt this, this concept because it would not allow a real lift and shift, right? This just run it inside confidential computing was not possible. You really, in, um, you really would need to adapt your application to do so, which meant that all of the other technologies, so AMD followed suit uh, with a technology called secure encrypted virtualization. ARM uh, created a, a specification for confidential computing and more hardware vendors and, and then also Intel uh, added a second technology. All of these other technologies, they follow a slightly different approach. So SGX is somewhat of like an outlier. I just want to mention it since it, you might hear, hear this in the context of confidential computing, um, but it's somewhat of like an outlier in terms of how this technology works because all other technologies, and now we get a bit more closer on, on, on what this means in practice and how you can use it and also plays a bit into this question about uh, limitations. All of these other technologies, the, the, the thing they allow you to do is to isolate a virtual machine. So instead of isolating a process, a single application, they would isolate a virtual machine. So if we talk about cloud and how you use cloud, and I'm not sure how familiar all of the audience is with the entire stack of the cloud, if you're just using Kubernetes, but virtual machines or virtualization is, is pretty much the de facto standard um, on, on, on the, um, how you actually use the actual silicon, the actual physical machines. Right? And, and how you can, um, as a cloud provider, how you can operate this and, and split these physical machines into for multiple tenants and make them usable for multiple tenants by adding this layer of, of virtualization, um, usually by a, something called a hypervisor. And if you talk about Kubernetes, for example, if you, you consume Kubernetes, usually what you do is you create a virtual machine for all of your Kubernetes nodes. So every Kubernetes nodes, um, is usually in a cloud setting. I'm saying usually because there are alternatives, but usually is a virtual machine, right? And so by applying confidential computing on the virtualization layer, this fits much better to the cloud model these days, where we can say um, we can um, we can cut off at the virtualization layer. We as the hosting provider, the cloud provider, the infrastructure we create a virtual machine uh, at some point in the stack for every of our tenants, of our customers, we can isolate this virtual machine um, and we can um, keep this as the confidential computing environment. And sorry if this sounds very abstract. In, in practice, I think we will see this gets a bit more clear. But essentially, this allows us as the hosting provider, the cloud provider, to keep ourselves outside of the screen box and only the customer, only the tenant is able to, to uh, access uh, this confidential computing environment. And if we have multiple tenants, right, we have a lot of confidential VMs, which are isolated on their own. So the, the individual tenants, the individual cloud customers, they cannot peek inside each other's confidential VM. And they cannot, if they break out of their confinement, if they break out of this VM, which is a virtual uh, privilege escalation in the cloud, they would still not be able to access another tenant's VM because it's protected by the processor, by the CPU um, as this in this picture, as this green box. And this, this is just the way of how we apply confidential computing. So the same properties apply, um, as I said before, which meaning the screen box is isolated, its memory pages are encrypted, and we can obtain a remote attestation report, meaning we can verify this uh, VM from remote. So for me, from my laptop, I can verify that Azure, GCP, AWS, whoever is my cloud provider, that they actually created this VM as a confidential VM, meaning that it's isolated and memory encrypted, and that it's running the image, this VM image I was telling it to. So if I said, please run a Ubuntu 20.04 uh, Linux system for me, I can verify that this actually booted and is running my Ubuntu 20.04 system 
and that nobody changed the the anything inside uh, my my image and uh, I don't know uh, added a backdoor or something. Yeah. Again, I talked. Yeah. Let's move ahead. Yeah. And uh, sorry again for for doing a a a a, a bit of a, a jump before getting back to this 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 part. Just as uh, now that we're speaking about a thing, it it makes sense. So now, as we've explained, right, this hardware needs to be available. It's provided by Intel, by AMD. If you buy one of their server CPUs, um, the latest generations, it will have this feature already baked in. Um, so it has those instructions that you can use to create confidential VMs. And then this needs to be enabled. Um, and this is usually not of our concern. Um, if you're a customer of, of, of uh, one of a cloud provider, um, they provide this virtualization layer. You usually don't care about it. So they need to make this accessible to you. Their hypervisors need to talk to the processor providing you with this environment. This is and this is exactly what you, what you do. And I link this down here. If you go to any, and I just link the hyperscalers. Uh, I don't want to um, discriminate any of the other cloud providers. They also have offerings, but I just limited this to, to the three hyperscalers. Um, so just that you get an idea. Um, so if you go, for example, here to Azure, uh, they have a page on confidential computing, um, which they have as an offering, right? They have their data centers. They have this hardware inside their data, this data centers. They enable their virtualization layer to make this available to you. And then they provide offerings. Um, for example, um, confidential VMs, the concept I've just shown, right? It's a product, infrastructure, a service. You can uh, just directly consume from, from Azure. And the same goes for, for GCP and AWS. They all have this, this, this notion of a confidential VM. Um, and you find all the details in, in, in what you need to do to create a, a VM in there um, in, as, as, as part of, of, of their offering. Um, so the, the way you would use this right now that we understand the basics and the hardware foundations is usually if we talk about cloud and let's limit here to cloud, um, is you go to your cloud provider and you will find, um, and let's also limit us to infrastructure service at this point, you will find offerings to uh, create um, a virtual machine uh, with confidential computing or to create a Kubernetes cluster with uh, nodes, uh, Siam just mentioned GKE with confidential VMs as the Kubernetes nodes. So you can consume this as part of the, the, the offerings from the cloud provider. Um, so that's our, our foundation. Um, we haven't yet talked about now, how do I actually interact with this? How does this verification work? We'll get to this in a second. Um, just just one more thing because I jumped over this in between part, and initially you mentioned this this workshop on on working on an AI cases. Um, what I've explained so far is is, is is just concerning the CPU. Now recently, uh, the latest Nvidia GPUs um, they have this, they have similar properties. They have also properties for for isolating and um, um, uh, isolating the code and data on the GPU and providing uh, attestation to verify the GPU. And this is meant to be attached to a confidential, uh, to a CPU with this feature to extend this, right? This isolate environment, not only to the CPU part, but also the GPU part. And you can generalize this to more accelerators that are coming in this space. Um, and I link this in the section here. Um, there's a section on the documentation NVIDIA and it has on there, on their, um, on their confidential computing and some more information for the very technical audience if they want to really dive deep in this, how this connection between the processor and the GPU works, how attestation works, um, what of kind of protocols are in generally uh, being developed to uh, extend this concept of confidential computing to uh, additional devices, right? Um, so this section is just for you. I think this is a bit beyond the, the, the scope of this, of this workshop. Um, but just for, for the interested audience, um, you can follow along. And I think the takeaway for anybody is this is not limited to just processors or, or CPUs, sorry. <laughs> um, but this can also be extended to something like a GPU. So you can um, do uh, um, um, some of the AI and, and machine learning 
uh, use cases with this technology as well. All right, um, just a brief uh, recap um, before I um, uh, before I go on. Um, so what we've seen is we, we we understood the or I hope we I, I've explained the the reasoning uh, behind why we want to do confidential computing. We haven't really talked about use cases, but uh, maybe we do, can do this in the end. Um, really, uh, the 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 the. the the reasoning behind the trust model and, and the threat model that's behind confidential computing, running something in an untrusted environment so that we can isolate and, 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 and shield us from this environment so that we don't need to trust the, the underlying infrastructure and the service provider uh, anymore. We saw that this is being enabled by uh, hardware. In the case of, of confidential computing, this is enabled by hardware features to, that allows us to create those isolated environments and while this is a hardware property, this needs to be enabled by the low-level software stack. And that's already being done by most of the cloud providers. So you will find confidential computing offerings at almost any cloud provider these days um, as infrastructure service to create isolated virtual machines, to create Kubernetes clusters with uh, isolated nodes. And that's also what I will go in, dive into a bit in the next part is, um, how this applies to our cloud native layer, how this applies to Kubernetes, um, where is the touch points, and then we can really go into more details on how we can use this uh, in the in the in the Kubernetes layer. Um, we'll get into practice in a second. Just I think one more technical foundation we need to cover. Just that you are on board and you know what's going on. Um, as I said, I want to explain a bit how this applies to, to Kubernetes. Um, and this picture, I think it's part of the prerequisites, right? That you have a basic understanding of, of Kubernetes and, and, and how it works. Um, this is just a reminder from a techno technology stack perspective. Um, if we have a Kubernetes cluster, where are we uh, dealing with virtual machines or potentially dealing with virtual machines? Because virtual machine is the the layer where we where confidential computing or the latest generation of confidential computing hardware applies this isolation. And as Sayam uh, say, sorry already um, mentioned, um, we have virtual machines. Uh, usually, in ninety percent of the cases, if we talk about a cloud environment, we have virtual machines for our Kubernetes nodes. That's the control plane. That's the worker nodes. And inside our application, right, it runs in inside containers. So, just from a logical perspective. I would say on a spectrum, there's two ways we can apply confidential computing. And I try to explain this on the spectrum. One is, and this is already what we, what, what we uh, or what I already mentioned briefly, we can apply this to the Kubernetes nodes. So by isolating our Kubernetes nodes inside confidential VMs, um, we can just do that. I mean, uh, as you've, or uh, as, we've, as we've said, this is available already as a service, even from the cloud providers themselves, right? There's GKE that has um, confidential VMs as the worker nodes. There is uh, AKS from Azure, the Azure Kubernetes service that has the same principle. And it isolates a Kubernetes node um, using confidential computing. And then you can just use it as usual. You deploy your containers inside. Because these containers run inside the confidential VM, they are isolated as part of, of their node as well. Um, and this concept generally is referred to as confidential clusters. So a confidential cluster, the idea is that we shield the entire cluster by isolating the nodes. Um, and by that, uh, we get the isolation of our containers uh, for free. So why are we not talking about confidential clusters? And we are more focusing on the right-hand side. I will get to in a second confidential containers. There's a downside to confidential clusters. And there's there are particular use cases where confidential clusters apply. The reason here is if we, um, or let's uh, let me start differently. The, the question is, what is the use case for confidential computing? Usually, the use case uh, is that we isolate against the infrastructure and the cloud service provider. There might be different reasons why we want to do so. It could be compliance. That's definitely a big topic here in Europe. Um, people 
uh, not being able to consume public cloud services due to the fact that they are American hyperscalers and there are a lot of privacy and and um, um, yeah data security laws that prevent you to process certain data just on 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 some uh, foreign infrastructure. Um, but there are also other cases where you're dealing with ver very sensitive information, right? Like uh, intellectual property, um, any kind of information that you're hesitant to share in such an environment due to the nature of being the cloud being a shared infrastructure space. And you're afraid of people breaking out of their infrastructure and, and, and um, doing virtual or horizontal uh, privilege escalation. So um, if that's your threat model, and that's a common threat model we are dealing with uh, in my day job, um, then um, applying confidential computing to your Kubernetes worker nodes means that you um, are provided with one property, which is runtime memory encryption. So if somebody phys physically goes to the data center, they won't be able to extract any kind of information because it's encrypted in memory. But if we talk about this isolation primitive, because the control plane of your cluster, and this is for GKE or AKS or any kind of this offering, they are managed by the cloud provider. So they are not running inside confidential VMs, um, or even if they would be, uh, the, cloud, the cloud provider would have ac need access to this control plane. And this opens the door again, right? First of all, this means the, the cloud provider has access to the control plane. And if you have access to the Kubernetes control plane, there's really not much you can do to prevent you accessing the, the worker nodes as well which means you break this isolation against the cloud provider. And for all of these compliance cases, then this is a no-go. Um, and um, if you think about horizontal explanation, exploitation and stuff, um, if you, to some extent, can, can get access um, to the cloud provider's backend, you will probably be able to, to find your way through to this cluster. So that's a big concern. And this is why um, uh, the common agreement is usually that you also need to isolate the control plane as well. And this is the full definition of a confidential cluster, it's fully isolated against the infrastructure, meaning control plane and worker nodes, both running inside confidential VMs, both being isolated against the infrastructure. And this means that because it's isolated against the infrastructure, you cannot consume this in a managed way. So you, this is not possible to implement this on, on GKE. Uh, at least there might be ways to do this by running all of the things autonomously. But as of now, it's not possible um, to do that. Um, so uh, with confidential cluster concepts, uh, we talk about uh, self-managed Kubernetes. All right, if not sure how people are familiar with this, but if you have a, a Kubernetes distribution, right, a um, um, Zuse Rancher or a uh, Red Hat OpenShift or a VMware Tanzu, right, these are distribution that package Kubernetes and you can deploy it using any kind of tooling to potentially the cloud or your on-prem environment, um, you can do the same for this confidential cluster concept, right? Deploying a confidential cluster um, and then um, operating it on your, on your own. Um, I, I spend a lot of time now explaining confidential clusters. I don't want to go into more detail uh, since it, this is a bit out of the scope for this, uh, for this workshop as well, um, but just that you get the idea, right? And you can imagine the downside now is you need to operate this cluster because it's isolated against the infrastructure. Why we wanted to do this in the first place is we wanted to isolate our application, right? We, we, the data and our application is really what we care about. We don't care about isolating uh, Azure's control plane, uh, at least not. Uh, that's not of our concern in most cases. Um, so the idea is interesting. Can we just isolate our container? Can we just use this technology to just isolate our container? And I'm not talking about the SGX approach, right? Isolating a process, a container is just a process. So we could apply this, but we talked about the downsides uh, already. Um, can we just take any container, any container, and isolate it this using this, this technology? And this is the idea that's behind confidential containers. And the goal is clear, I guess, right? Having any kind of Kubernetes cluster, think about your typically GKE, AKS, whatever you're using. Um, um, can we apply confidential computing to just these containers? And remember that this, ice, this uh, confidential computing in this case means isolating VMs. So there's a semantic gap, right? Let me go back one step. There's a semantic gap because our node is a VM, but our pod is, or our pod just contains containers. Uh? So how do we isolate our pod? How do we isolate our containers? 
using this VM form of isolation. And the approach that's been taken there, or the most promising approach taken there, um, is that we adopt the idea um, of isolating a container as a VM. I mean, uh, sounds straightforward, uh, but um, there are different technologies that apply this concept. You might have heard of uh, AWS Firecracker. You might have heard of um, uh, there are a lot of more 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 projects in the space. Um, but you might have heard of, of Kata containers, um, and this is exactly the the project that took off of this idea, um, isolating a container as a VM. Um, for the simple reason being that you are afraid of this container. That's the fundamental idea of these technologies um, because you consume containers from anybody potentially um, as a hosting provider and you are afraid of container breakouts and this kind of stuff. If you use VM isolation for individual containers, you have a, let's say, a little bit stronger form of isolation. So this is why these projects were started. Um, and this is the idea behind Kata containers and AWS Firecracker and so forth. Um, but the cool thing about those is that they solve this problem. They solve this problem of the semantic gap for us. Because once we isolate a container as a VM, all we need to do is flick the switch and run this, v this container in a confidential VM instead of a regular VM. And this is a very detailed slide. Uh, and if you're not completely familiar with containers, I, I don't think this is really that much important that you understand all of the aspects here. But this is the usual flow in a very abstract way of uh, the container runtime that's running inside your Kubernetes nodes for running your containers um, using um, Linux namespaces, control groups for isolating your con or isolating your application as a as a container on this node. And the approach that Kata Containers uh, takes is um, basically cutting off somewhere in this path, and instead of using Linux namespaces and control groups, we run a small micro VM on top of our of our node of our host and we have some very small kernel some agent and then we can run our kubernetes pod inside there and i don't think we need to go into all the details um if you have detailed questions please please put them in the chat or or we we can follow up on later but um the fundamental idea is just we create a, a small micro virtual machine instead of a of a usual um Linux namespace based isolation for this for this application for our Kubernetes pod. And as I said, right, if we just flick the switch and we tell the hypervisor to create a confidential VM by asking the CPU and the hardware to use confidential computing isolation for this VM, um, what we get is we isolate an individual container inside our Kubernetes environment uh, using confidential computing technology. And this idea and this concept was born out of the Katak project um, and was started as uh, the con a project that's actually called Confidential Containers. And this is now a CNCF sandbox project that's um, hardware agnostic. Uh, it's um, um, yeah, a collaboration project between uh, a lot of players in the industry, so the hardware vendors themselves, the cloud providers, uh, individual, in, individual software vendors such as uh, Red Hat or us, uh, we are collaborating on this um, to build confidential containers um, with this idea of isolating a container inside a confidential VM in your Kubernetes environment. All right, um, just one brief uh, reminder, what did we achieve so far if we do exactly this? Uh, from a threat, threat model, and, it, and, and we talk about use cases, really, it's all about why are we doing this in the first place and what's our threat model. Um, if we do confidential containers, um, we can actually cut off a huge part of our cloud stack from this Im implicitly trusted, uh, and in confidential computing, we like to call this the trusted computing base, all of the components and elements we need to trust. Um, we can reduce the trusted computing base to only our workload that we shield as part of this confidential container. The code that runs, of course, inside this green box, right, is this Kata micro VM, uh, micro kernel, uh, the Kata agent, and then our container, right? If you want to go into detail, there are some components running inside there. 
but it's essentially just our code um, and this 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 runtime inside, and the hardware, the CPU is our trust anchor. But anything in between, um, just from a logical point of view, is out of the box. This could mean there is a vulnerability inside our application that confidential computing is not protecting you against attacks through the front door, right? Just that you that we get this straight, right? This is really about uh, attacks through the infrastructure, let's say from below in a sense. Um, just wanted to, to, to remind on this because it's really always good to keep in mind why we are doing this and, and what did we achieve. Um, but let's get more, more practical. Um, so um, some some references uh, I have in this in this list, right? There's the confidential containers project. Let me actually close the the other link so we don't get confused here. Um, the confidential containers project. Uh, you find most of uh, the information uh, to go further. Uh, their documentation. Um, if you want to join the community, all of the relevant links you can find here. Um, the CNCF link, I think that's just redundant because uh, you will find most things from the GitHub. Uh, another link to Kata containers if you want to read more about this um, concept. Another link uh, if you're not familiar with what we just explained and, and, and same also explained this, this path from Kubernetes Cupola to your container. Uh, I just added a link for even reading more about this. And then there are two more links that go now more into the detail about confidential containers. And this is what I would like to do now is, is that we get a bit more practical. Um, what I haven't explained is here, and this is really, uh, um, bear with me, the last theoretical part here. Um, now there are, um, if we want to do this concept and we think about the cloud, think about GKE cluster, AKS cluster, we have Kubernetes nodes as our virtual machines. Um, there are two options we have to do this now. Because we need to create a virtual machine for every pod, this virtual machine can either be a nested virtual machine inside our Kubernetes node. And from a technical perspective, this is quite a delicate topic. Uh, from you as a consumer of the cloud, you don't care. <laughs> um, uh, but it means that you need to run a VM inside a VM. Um, and you, yeah, building this is it can be quite complex. Um, but um doesn't really matter. This is option one. Uh, option two is, um, and this option can be of two things. Either you don't have nested virtualization. As I said, this is this is, can be quite complex. Or you don't want nested virtualization. Because for whatever reason, you're afraid of performance impact or you're afraid of that there might be things implemented incorrectly and stuff. The other option, if we don't have nested virtualization, is something that in the Kubernetes uh, and sorry in the confidential containers project world is either called peer pods or um, uh, remote hypervisor concept. Essentially, what this means is that we are saying we create all of our pods as dedicated VMs in the cloud. So if you think of this as uh, your your cloud environment, you have your Kubernetes cluster. Um, you might have some other services in the cloud. Now, this Kubernetes cluster, whenever you schedule a pod, it will create an actual VM that you see as part of your cloud uh, uh, um, uh, services that's being created. And the pod is running inside this VM. And then traffic is tunneled through back to your Kubernetes cluster. So from a Kubernetes perspective, it looks like this, right? Uh, um, uh, it follows the path of the container runtime. So it looks like this pod is actually just running inside the cluster itself, right? Because from a Kubernetes perspective, it doesn't really care where the runtime class is actually running that as long as it yeah, communicates as it uses the usual communication paths. Um, so we can do this um, using this peer pod concept by creating all of these pods as dedicated confidential VMs inside the cloud. Um, and this is uh, um, in a, um, a sub project of this cloud native uh, of this confidential containers project. It's called the cloud API adapter, which is essentially the glue code that's necessary to uh, whenever you say schedule this pod, pod to create this pod as a dedicated confidential VM inside your your cloud environment, and then um, um, yeah, managing and, and and organizing or operating these confidential VMs or these micro VMs uh, for your pods. And this is right now um, 
in particular necessary because nested virtualization, nested virtual, virtualization <laughs> is only available for confidential VMs in Azure, in Microsoft Azure right now. So G, uh, GCP and AWS, they don't have nested virtualization. Um, partially because um, the Linux uh, kernel, the um, uh, KVM hypervisor, so the Linux native hypervisor, does not have nested virtualization for uh, the processors. So that's uh, what I've shown earlier here, right? They don't have nested virtualization for either Intel TDX or AMD SUV right now. Only Azure has this because they have their own hypervisor called Hyper-V. Doesn't really um, need to concern you too much. It just needs that means that on Azure, you can create those confidential containers as yeah, nested VMs. Um, if you run this in, in GCP or if you run this on, on AWS, um, you would go, need to go through this cloud API adapter and create them as, as dedicated VMs. Um, from a use case perspective, and now we will get to the actual uh, using this, you won't really need, mean, see a difference in the sense that for you, it's just a container runtime class um, that you install inside this cluster. And this takes care of doing, the, doing this underneath. Um, but it has, of course, some implications in terms of performance, startup time. Um, but that, I think that's a bit out of the scope maybe for this uh, session. Um, from just using it, it almost feels the same in the sense that there's a runtime class and it takes care of running the, those uh, containers inside confidential containers. All right. Um, now um, let's actually uh, get into, into practice. Um, and what we need to do is um, for actually using this, actually using this confidential containers, is two things. We need to create a Kubernetes cluster that has uh, hardware underneath that either supports, uh, yeah, um, AMD SCV, Intel TDX, ARM CCA, and so forth, um, uh, even IBM Secure Execution. Um, nevertheless. Um, um, that's something, um, yeah, you can either, either set this up in your, in your own data center if you have this, or you need to, um, consume, um, uh, a cloud offering that provides you with these capabilities. And as I said, on, on AKS, you can create a Kubernetes cluster that has this nested virtualization available on GKE or, um, AWS. You can just create a, uh, a regular, uh, Kubernetes cluster and then install this cloud API adapter um, or more or less just install this cloud API adapter or install a runtime class using this cloud API adapter for um, um, for creating confidential VMs as dedicated VMs. For the ease of, 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 of use and I think for, for um, the most straightforward way to, to just trying this out and playing with this is, is using the nested virtualization on Azure since we don't need to deal with the, the cloud API adapter in this case. And, and Azure has this nested virtualization in a preview um, I've linked here. And uh, you can read more about uh, what Azure has to say about this and the consideration and so forth. Um, and uh, the, the actual steps you need to go through to um, create an AKS cluster uh, with these capabilities. <clears throat> We've uh, summarized these steps and make this as hopefully straightforward as possible in a guide here for creating a uh, confidential a, a cluster with confidential containers capabilities on AKS in our contrast project. We'll see after after the, this step. Um, but this guide is just something you can follow along to actually create a um, AKS uh, that has confidential containers capabilities. And what you need is you need an Azure account, of course. Um, you need the permissions to create a, an AKS cluster. You need to um, um, enroll in this preview, or um, you don't need to enroll in this preview. I think it's a public preview. But you need to um, enable, if you create this AKS cluster with the CI, you need to enable this, this preview um, uh, extension in the, in the CLI. And, and after you uh, register this, this preview feature, um, you can actually go ahead in the next step and, and start uh, creating this, this AKS cluster. And this is what I would now do and, and go into practice and we actually create a Kubernetes cluster, uh, create confidential containers. Um, um, okay, so 
I have a demo environment. Let me actually rearrange my windows. Um, so I need to don't need to go through the slides all the time. I have a demo environment here. Uh, I hope this is large enough to read. This is just a VS Code. Um, I have my console down here, uh, as you can see. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll open files up there. Uh, I think that's uh, hopefully the most compact uh, way to, to, to showcase this. Yep, looks good to me. Perfect. Um, what I have here is I have the Azure uh, CLI installed. Um, I have uh, followed the steps explained here. So I logged into my Azure account. I've installed this extension as described here. Um, no, sorry, I en enabled the, the, the preview extension and then I installed the, the uh, confidential containers preview on, on AKS. Um, so it should uh, show that this is actually installed here. We are registered, which is great. Um, and what I'd like to do now is uh, create a cluster um, that uh, provides us with um, nodes that have uh, Cocoa capability. And yeah, I just follow these steps. Uh, first of all, I create a, a resource group. Um, And yeah, I don't know, uh, location you can find up here. You can choose your favorite location. Uh, default here is, is West US. Uh, just going to stick with that. And then I create the resource group. Um, so just create a resource group called Contrast Demo in location West US. If you're not familiar with Azure and all of these terms, such as resource group and so, um, don't worry about it. Um, um, let's let's just focus on, on, the, on, the, on the Kubernetes part. Um, which um, we're doing right now is we create a AKS cluster, a Azure Kubernetes cluster. Um, oops. Let me show you the details. Uh, inside this resource group uh, um, with Kubernetes version 1.29, uh, um, uh, and uh, this is just the, the regular cluster because right now in Azure, one limitation is you cannot create the cluster directly with nodes that have this confidential computing capabilities. Um, I don't know the reason behind this, but what we need to do is we need to create a cluster. We create a node pool that has uh, this, um, uh, this, uh, this, this workload runtime uh, installed, and then we can create the initial node pool if we, if we want to, but we can also omit this step. That's um, yeah. That's just some some weird quirk on on this preview right now. But uh, don't worry about it. Um, in the end, we will have an AKS cluster with nodes that have this nested virtualization capability uh, that we need for for um, for our confidential containers. And uh, for the interested audience, uh, yeah, this is based on AMD's uh, secure encrypted virtualization right now. The preview. Yeah. This runs for uh, some a short while until the, the cluster is created. Um, so let's let me outline what, we, what we're going to do. Um, inside this cluster, uh, we'll take a look at this, at this runtime, right? The things that I've shown in the slides. Um, uh, to go from here, right? This is your regular container D runtime. Um, that you're provided with uh, in a regular AKS, AKS cluster. We need to get to here where we have a runtime that is capable of creating confidential VMs for every uh, pod that we want to, to run uh, as part of this confidential containers deployment. And what's necessary is um, this uh, host kernel, right? This is what we are doing right now. We're installing AKS cluster that has the host kernel. In this case, it's not KVM, it's Hyper-V, but doesn't really matter, um, that has the right hypervisor. And then we um, we need to install a, in Kubernetes, called a runtime class um, that defines, and we will see in a second, that defines container D to use the cutter shim uh, instead of, uh, or yeah, the confidential containers cutter shim instead of the, the regular uh, container D shim. And um, 
this um, this cutter shim is then uh, um, configured to use um, uh, to call on the hypervisor to create a nested virtual machine. Uh, um, this is possible to do this with QMO. QMO is the counterpart, the user land part to, to KVM um, on Azure Cloud Hypervisor. Um, yeah, it's not a one to one mapping, but Cloud Hypervisor is, is to some extent an alternative here to QMO. Um, and, and Azure's preview uses uh, Cloud Hypervisor to talk to Hyper V. Uh, they, are, they are Hypervisor to create these um, confidential VMs. So uh, this component needs to be installed on the node. Um, and we need to call this component and tell it to create a micro nested confidential VM using a um, pre-configured image. When I say image, I mean virtual machine image that contains a small kernel that contains some agent code, right, to communicate uh, to the outside world um, and communicate with the the um, the host and the, the Kubernetes part, right, the kubelet and so forth. Um, and then um, it should um, uh, load our pod and, and run our pod inside. We'll go into the details in a second, but uh, let me actually check if it finished uh, completing this. Not yet. Um, Okay, so we'll define a runtime class um, that has all, all of these cap capabilities. And um, if we install this on, on the Azure Preview, it actually comes with a pre-configured runtime class, I'm sorry, to do exactly that. And as you can imagine, this is one of the integral parts of this confidential containers project is um, enabling Kata to do this kind of stuff, um, building this, this runtime class to, um, to um, have all of these components in a in a way configured in a way that they can run inside a confidential VM uh, that they are aware of this confidential computing aspects. Um, so, um, oh no, it has completed. Um, so let me just copy paste the second step. This just adds another node pool that has these capabilities. Um, so this is why um, they're. Um, um, different entities in this confidential containers project uh, work on uh, providing this runtime class. And I said Azure has this pre-configured. We will take a look at this in a second. So, so Azure is, 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 is working on a runtime class. And then there is a, another sub-project um, similar to how Cloud a API Adapter is a, yeah, if you want to call it sub-project, a sub-project to Coco, there's the runtime class operator. And this is a Kubernetes operator um, that's goal is to manage runtime classes for confidential containers, right? Um, so this defines a custom uh, resource definition um, for uh, managing and, 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 and orchestrating these uh, confidential container runtime classes. Um, yeah, understanding these runtime classes has, has two problems. One, you need to be very familiar with all of this low level stuff. Um, about containers and container runtimes and so forth. And the others, in our case, you need to also be familiar a lot of this confidential computing aspects because there are a lot of um, little uh, tweaks and quirks uh, that need to work together um, to make um, this runtime class actually useful uh, for you. So this runtime class needs to be um, aware of the, the hardware underneath, right? It needs to uh, be able to instruct the hypervisor to correctly create a confidential VM on this uh, different hardwares like Intel's, AMD's, and so forth. Um, it needs to do attestation. Uh, this is something we will talk at, in the last part of this of this uh, workshop um, when we actually talk about how to operate these confidential containers. So there are a lot of different little things. Um, so this is a very busy, busy part of, of the Confidential Containers project. And handling these runtime classes can be right, quite complex. Um, and therefore, um, this, uh, this operator was created. Um, oh, no, it's finished. Perfect. And um, this is also why Azure has this pre-configured specifically for their setup, for their hypervisor um, and their virtualization stack to make this uh, more or less straightforward for you. Now we can go actually and see what, what, what Azure has pre-configured because our cluster is ready. Um, so let me jump into here. 
so now we have our cluster. It is an AKS cluster. It has two uh, nodes. One is the original one, and one is the one we created from our uh, confidential container uh, ready node pool. And um, let me actually show that there is already a runtime class installed. So this runtime class, um, uh, no, sorry. My kubectl skills are actually quite bad. So <laughs> you <laughs> I guess most of the audience is, is, is much more fluent in this than I am, um, but never mind. Um, Yes. Um, uh, so yeah, this this runtime class here um, has the the cutter CC, so the the cutter uh, confidential computing um, as as the defined handler, and this is this is what's pre-installed by Azure, and this defines this uh, image that will be used for running our micro VMs. This defines how um, this handler talks to the hypervisor to create those confidential VMs. And so forth, um, and this needs to fit. Uh, as I said, needs to fit the underlying hardware and needs to fit our attestation, right? The way we want to verify uh, these confidential containers um, in the end. Um, but I'll, I'll I'll go into that in a, in, a, in a second. So what we can now do is, all right, we can use this runtime class potentially um, to create a, a container definition, right? If you uh, do um, um, uh, create a YAML file for uh, creating a deployment. You can add your uh, your container or your pod to this deployment, and you can specify this as the the runtime class. And then um, the kubelet and and uh, all of the 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 flow in between will start this container inside a nested confidential virtual machine. So this is all we need to basically run any kind of container as a confidential container. Um, all of the magic I've explained beforehand uh, is pretty much hidden by, from you through this, this runtime class and everything that, that happens underneath. One more, one more link on this runtime class. Um, this now dives a bit also into, 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 into contrast. Um, but uh, I don't want to go into, into, into contrast just yet, just about this, this runtime class, um, because we have some, some documentation on um, the, uh, the runtime class itself. Um, or let me actually go into, into uh, oh, no, it's, uh, it's better explained here, I guess, right? Um, we have this, this, um, uh, this overview and uh, called node level comp components here. And this is, um, more or less the the same uh, for any kind of confidential container deployment based on on Kata. Um, so what you need on on all of the nodes, right, on your usual Kubernetes node where there's a kubelet and there's container D and container D shim and so forth. Um, what what components you need additionally, right, is some type of uh, user land component of your hypervisor. In this case, in Azure, it's cloud hypervisor, but it could be QMO. So this needs to be installed. Um, this image, that's actually the image of those micro VMs, that's need, that, that needs to be available. Yeah, And this image contains um, a small agent that the, the shim can talk to, to for communication and stuff. Um, and this needs a component for pulling your container image. So this goes very much into the details of container runtime. So don't need to uh, maybe explain all of this in, in this scope here. But essentially, um, there are some components need to be installed. And um, usually, you can do this with a daemon set that takes care of installing all of these components on every node uh, that you want to run confidential containers on. Um, and this is something. Um, that Azure uh, does underneath uh, when you install this uh, this feature flag, I install with this feature flag. Um, all right. Um, yes. Um, as I said, all we need to do um, at this point is basically create a container uh, using defining this um, 
runtime class as the runtime class uh, we want to run this pop in. Um, not sure. Here's an example, right? Uh, if you were to replace this with, um, sorry, with kata CC isolation, right? At this runtime class name, um, this is what you would need to do. So last step before we can actually apply uh, an application um, is to do to go one little step back. Um, and I like to actually go to the slides just that you get the idea. Um, one thing that the confidential containers community next to this runtime class is most concerned with, or is putting a lot of uh, effort into, is the question, um, let's assume we isolate all of our pods inside confidential containers. What, what we could do right now, just defining this runtime class, is um, our goal, our goal here, right, is to isolate our container, our workload from the underlying infrastructure including the Kubernetes part, um, which includes the Kubernetes control plane, right? In, in our AKA cluster at this point, we don't even see this control plane. It's managed for us and, and all of this stuff. So in the speak of confidential computing, this Kubernetes part is outside of our trusted computing base. It's outside of the components that are isolated and then we can verify and that we can trust. So a, 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 a big part of, um, um, the, be the things we need to take care of now is thinking about how can we keep our pot isolated uh, if the rest of this cluster, other than our runtime class, is basically untrusted. So to give you some ideas, because it's very abstract, if we now go ahead and we say um, um, kubectl apply, on a YAML file that has this runtime class. It will create this pod inside this confidential container. Uh, all things are good. Um, if we add, uh, let's say, uh, in, our run in our pod definition, we specify an image, right? We say, please run Nginx. How do we know that this pod actually runs Nginx? And it does not run Nginx minus uh, Azure backdoor.com. <laughs> Just Random example. I don't want to bash Azure at this point. Just to give you a random example, right? Um, or, or or a malicious container uh, uh, instead of engines. How do we know that it does not run malicious container? If we specify a environment variable to say it should, uh, um, um, I don't know, uh, use API key uh, X. How do we prevent this Kubernetes part, this API uh, server? Uh, the kubelet and all of these components, they are untrusted, right, in our sense. How do we uh, prevent them from stealing this information? Or how do we prevent somebody uh, that has access to uh, the, whole, the cloud infrastructure for doing kubectl exec and accessing our container? And then from there, just doing whatever they want to and steal our data. Um, and how can one pod, let's say we have an Nginx web server front end, we have some business logic, they need to communicate with, with each other. How do we prevent somebody sitting on the network from intercepting these connections and stealing the data? Or somebody is just starting another pod, um, let's say uh, um, bad container again, and Nginx wants to communicate with our business logic, but it communicates with this uh, malicious container instead. So what I'm going to say is, first of all, we need to protect and isolate our container from the surrounding environment so that the all of the instructions and all of the communications with the kubelet and all of the outside parts, how are they also um, limited to what we define as benign uh, operations? And how do we have a form of identity and authentication for these confidential containers so we can actually verify that this runs our engines image and it not runs some, some other... Um, um, potentially malicious image. And this is all based on essentially um, attestation on one part, this attestation, this verifiability aspect that we haven't really talked about yet. And it's being based on um, um, the fact that we can isolate our container effectively from its surrounding environment. And um, there are um, two 
aspects to this. One is, of course, attestation. We need to do attestation. So we need to connect to our pod. We need to obtain this attestation statement from the hardware itself, right? This is what the CPU provides us with. This is signed statement saying, yes, this is actually a confidential container. And yes, it's actually running our image. This is one aspect. And the other aspect, and there are two paths that are followed by the confidential containers community. One is called runtime policies, and one is called split API. Um, I hope I've linked both inside our notes here. Um, let me actually go back. Um, oh, no, I haven't. Uh, probably due to the fact that split API uh, is sub of like a working group inside uh, the confidential container. Confidential, co confidential container community. Um, and um, for um, runtime policies, I will actually uh, add another link to where we explain a bit uh, what runtime policies are about. Um, um, since we're already pretty late, uh, I'm not going to go into all the details of split API. Um, um, simply, the idea is to split the Kubernetes API that exists between um, the, uh, hopefully I'm using the right terms here, the container runtime and uh, interface and uh, um, our container into what we call benign interactions and let's say privileged interactions. So you cannot do, do kubectl exec, but you can, for example, I don't know, um, uh, I don't have a good example, uh, do any, yeah, do a benign operation that's not, uh, um, um, that's not really affecting the security or the, the integrity of our container. Um, the problem I see uh, with split API that this means there needs to be a trusted component that um, performs these privilege instructions. And if there's no manual user <laughs> that's sitting next to the kubelet and doing this, or if we're not having a trusted kubelet or a split kubelet where there's a trusted party, um, and then we have a, uh, a chicken and egg problem again, because how do we establish trust in that kubelet? I think there's a lot of open questions. Um, so if you're interested in this, uh, there's a sub uh, uh, group in the confidential containers uh, community you'll find in the, in the Slack channel um, that's linked as part of the GitHub repo. Um, the runtime policy, and uh, this is maybe a bit of a personal opinion, is, 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 is more, I think, more uh, practical and feasible at this point. The idea of a runtime policy is essentially translating your Kubernetes YAML into a policy. So um, if you specify in your Kubernetes YAML run image uh, Nginx, this policy checks is actually Nginx being deployed in, inside this container, uh, inside this confidential container. And if, you, if I go back to this image here, um, there's an agent sitting in between uh, my pod and the outside world. And this agent can verify this policy. And in every uh, operation or every command that comes in from the outside can check against the policy, is this, cor is co is this correctly applying my policy? So um, again, I've talked a lot of things, and we haven't really gone, gone into practice and deployed an application. Um, essentially, the goal um, that uh, yeah um, we'd like to do with contrast, and this is the, the project that Sam si uh, uh, explained in the beginning. Um, is to make this additional challenges as easy as possible. So beyond the runtime class, how do we solve these additional challenges? How do we verify our entire deployment? How do we protect our deployment with uh, runtime policies? Making this straightforward. Sometimes to what the runtime operator is for runtime, uh, this is not an operator, but it's it's think of it like a, a tool for for making this uh, this this straightforward and easy to use. And I think it's it's best explained if I if I go into practice and and then we can see um, if it makes sense to you or if there are questions. So, um, an example. Let's start with an example. Let's say you have an application. This is a very basic microservice application, right? It has a web front end and has two backend services, yeah, somewhat of like a business logic and a yeah stateful uh, <laughs> data. Um, think of like a database or something, right? This is just for voting on your favorite emoji. So quite a cute application. Um, how do we can we deploy this with confidential containers? And this uses the the contrast project to um, 
take care of this runtime policy part, take care of this attestation part. Um, and um, the steps we need to follow to, to actually deploy this and then verify this based on, on runtime policies is essentially, um, let me actually download the deployment first. Yeah, this is just um, installing this deployment, uh, downloading this deployment. And this is just one big uh, YAML file where all of these deployments are. So this is the emoji service, there's the voting service, there's the web front end service and so forth. Um, um, we actually install a, another con confidential container runtime class. So similar to what Azure already did, uh, we install a um, another runtime class uh, that can uh, deal with these runtime policies um, and deal with the, uh, the 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 attestation aspects. Um, we can go into detail. I just want to do the practice first and then do the theory behind it. Um, so if I check now, we have two runtime classes. Um, one is the original uh, Azure one that was installed. And now we have a second runtime class that has a different handler. Um, but it works more or less the same as our uh, initial runtime class from, from Azure that we installed. So it has the same kind of concept behind it. <coughs> um, and um, let me uh, do this, install this. Uh, coordinator first, and then I'll explain the, the reason and the, uh, what this is uh, in the next step. So what we're going to do now, um, as I said, we're going to translate our Kubernetes YAML deployments into these runtime policies so that we can later on verify that all of our containers are uh, correctly started, they have the right runtime policy, um, they have the right image, and so forth. So with contrast, we can generate these runtime policies based on an existing deployment. So Right, we have this deployment as YAML file. Let's generate the, the runtime policies from it. And this reference values that we're specifying here is that we're saying um, this, uh, this deployment should be run on AKS. It should use Cloud Hypervisor. That's just the hypervisor that Azure uses here under the hood. And it should run on SNP. Uh, SNP stands for AMD Secure Encrypted Virtualization. And the latest version is called SNP, short uh, secure nested paging. This is just specifying the hardware. So we're saying all of our containers should run on AKS. They should uh, use a cloud hypervisor for creating these confidential VMs. And they should use uh, confidential VMs based on AMD's uh, underlying uh, hardware. Um, let me generate these, these runtime policies. And if we check now uh, our deployment file, we added something here. Um, so two things have been added. Uh, let me see if I uh, find the right spot. Uh, one thing is we added the runtime class, right? This is what we saw earlier. We added the runtime class to say this um, container should run inside uh, the, the confidential VM. And we um, added uh, an annotation. And this annotation contains the policy for this container. Um, so this policy um, um, is essentially, and I will, I will go into detail um, once we go into the actual verification part, it's essentially, as I said, it's a translation of what we see here in YAML into a uh, policy language, uh, in this case, using the open policy agents uh, language, uh, Rego. Um, but this is just an, a detail, a very technical detail. Um, yeah, essentially translating this YAML into a policy. So inside our confidential container, an agent can verify uh, what's being applied to our confidential container adheres to this uh, YAML that we have that we specified. All right, um, so from that point on, what we can already do is we can create all of these confidential containers. They will be isolated against the host, right, through confidential VMs. They will be isolated against the Kubernetes environment through runtime policies. Um, and we can now go ahead and verify all of them individually. So we can talk to every confidential container and ask them, hey, please provide me uh, with your attestation statement so I can verify you are actually a benign confidential container. Since this doesn't really scale well, and I don't want to do this in an online phase, right? me as the administrator of this cluster in my local laptop, 
I don't want to sit in front of this laptop. And whenever my, my application scales, I don't want to verify all of these individual containers. Um, we just bundle this attestation um, in what's typically called in confidential computing terms, an attestation service, some trust anchor that I can, um, that does the attestation for me um, for all of these individual containers. And I only need to verify this trust anchor once and it transitively verifies all of my containers. That's a very typical pattern um, that you might need to wrap your head around, um, but it just allows to do attestation in a scalable way without verifying all individual instances. Um, and this trust anchor, this attestation service in our case is what I've installed and what I've skipped in my explanation is when we installed this coordinator. So this coordinator is the, this attestation service. It runs inside the cluster already since I uh, completed this command. So I can do kubectl, uh, get pods. I've just installed it in the default namespace. Um, there's this coordinator running. And this coordinator is also running um, uh, as part as a confidential container. Um, let me see if it says the container runtime in here. Um, as I said, my kubectl is pretty bad. So um, please bear with me. With me. Um, yeah, it says runtime class, right? Uh, this is not verification at this point, right? I'm, I haven't verified this coordinator. I'm just showing you the, the runtime class. So this is uh, specified as run inside uh, a confidential container. So going back to this image, right? We have this attestation service that itself runs inside a confidential container. I can verify this once. This is now my trust anchor. And this can now take care of verifying all of my containers. And to verify all of my containers, it needs to know what to verify on. And therefore, we need to provide it with the expected uh, deployment. And this expected deployment is defined by its runtime policies, right? Every runtime policy is somewhat of like the fingerprint of this confidential container. So we can group all of these runtime policies in a, um, yeah, a configuration file. So we say uh, there's an emoji service, there's a voting service, there's a rep front end. Um, there's some information about the hardware underneath. Um, there's some information about this Kata micro VM image that all of these containers should be running in. So this is some of like the, the reference, the ground tooth evidence that we can verify on based on this attestation um, that confidential computing provides us with. And this manifest, um, or it's called manifest, right? This configuration uh, we can set uh, with our attestation service, which is actually the next step is to set the manifest. I first need to, oops, need to um, get the connection to the coordinator. And once I got the address of the coordinator, I can um, use the contrast CLI to actually set this manifest. Um, and this takes this file, manifest.json, it connects to the coordinator, it does a remote attestation uh, procedure underneath, establishes this coordinator as our trust anchor, and defines the coordinator with um, this um, this uh, manifest file or this manifest JSON. Oh. And from that point on, on you, I can just deploy my application. All right, my application has been slightly modified in the sense that we took this YAML files and we extended this with an attestation about the runtime policy, and we extended the it with a um, a run task, runtime class name. Other than that, um, um, yeah, it's not entirely true. We also added some some components, but I, I'll omit this uh, for the, the sake of the demo. Um, but uh, essentially, this is the two important aspects uh, just from a Kubernetes point of view. Um, and once now we can deploy this uh, um, application as usual, we can deploy these deployment files and the application, they will all come up. Um, so they will all come up as, sorry if I jump a bit uh, too much here, but they will all come up inside confidential VMs. This confidential VM will run a microkernel, it will run a micro agent. Um, part of this um, is, 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 is um, an init initializer that will do this attestation procedure. It will talk to our um, attestation service. It will verify itself or the attestation service will verify this as a 
regular confidential container, uh, we'll verify that the right runtime policy was applied, and then um, we'll um, um, complete the, the initialization of this confidential container. And if I check now, kubectl uh, get pods, um, I see now there's an emoji service running, there's a voting, uh, sorry, a voting service running and a, a web front end running, and all of them have been verified by this coordinator. So if I check the logs of the coordinator, I will see that uh, I said I was setting the manifest, and then um, there was uh, a bunch of services asking um, for uh, verification, and they have all been correctly verified uh, based on this on this manifest. And from a trust point of view, sorry to go once more back to the slides. Uh, and, and as a summary, what we now achieved is that all of our services run inside confidential containers. All of them um, are isolated against the Kubernetes environment using this runtime policy. And all of them have been verified. So all of them have been verified that the correct image is running there, that they're indeed running inside a confidential container environment, and that this attestation service has verified them all uh, based on what I've configured uh, in my manifest. And I could still um, deploy the container as usual, right? I didn't do any modifications to the container itself. Um, I did some additions to this deployment files in the sense of specifying a, a runtime class and, and spare specifying this, this runtime policy used for verification. But other than that, it's just my usual YAML deployment. I could have also done this with a Helm chart or so, something like that. Um, all right, so this was pretty fast, uh, maybe too fast for, for some of you. So um, I guess uh, there are probably a lot of questions. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so one, one thing is you mentioned uh, sometime back, like when you are running the Kata containers, it mm -hmm. will automatically create a virtual machine and then sync back. So when you, ha you have created this deployment, did it create VMs in the Azure console? Um, it did not create a, a dedicated VMs that I would see in my Azure console, if, you, if that's what you mean. Um, yes. Let me go to the Azure portal and go to um, my, no, that's the wrong one, sorry. Uh, Kubernetes services, contrast demo, resource group, contrast demo, yeah. That's my resource group. My resource group just consists of this AKS cluster. It does not consist of multiple VMs. Um, but the reason for that is that Azure is capable of creating those um, Kata confidential VMs as nested VMs inside the nodes of this cluster, right? So if I go into this cluster, um, there are multiple nodes, uh, or there are at least two nodes, and um, they are running these um, Kata VMs as nested virtual machines, which I don't see. And uh, and this, this is automatic that is being done, but you said this is not possible in other uh, environments because of the uh, capabilities yeah. that Linux does not provide them to do the nested virtualization. Correct. And for that, there is a project that you mentioned, which was um, Cloud that's, API Adapter. Correct. Um, that's linked uh, in here, uh, Cloud API Adapter. Yeah. And if I would use Cloud API Adapter, I would actually see all of these... Um, all of these confidential VMs as dedicated VMs here. Ah, okay. Understood. Understood. Yeah. And for this particular thing, what you have done is so you uh, created a AKS cluster first, and then you added a node pool, another node pool with the runtime class specified, and that runtime class uh, when it created, so Azure automatically took care of having the right hypervisor, uh, making sure it has Kata components installed, configured, and then connecting it back to the Kubernetes cluster so that it's ready to run the um, confidential containers. Um, then you discussed all the problems in the current ecosystem where you have the node which is there, but you still have components like the kube api server which is from the control plane it is able to communicate with the kubelet 
Uh, so there is still access because the whole idea when we started the confidential compare co computing stuff is to isolate the communication from uh, the outside world. But in this particular case, the non-isolated workloads are still able to communicate in the isolated VM that was created. So there is being there is work being done in that uh, sense in the working group on new methodologies like the split API and um, and things like that, uh, which is in progress, how to do it in a more efficient manner and how to test out stuff, uh, whether this is running as the confidential containers or not, and then the uh, policies that you applied. And then coming to the contrast, so contrast works uh, as of now only with the AKS. And contrast is, uh, contrast lets you create those, create the policies, attach those policies, uh, verify those attestations uh, so that it can know that this particular the the container that is running is the actual one that you are running. And when you when what I mean by creating the policies is it it takes up the manifest, use OPA uh, policies, and create the annotations and then add those annotations back to the deployment. And then you deploy the application. And when you are deploying, it checks uh, the stateful set uh, checks the annotation from the deployment and checks whether it's you know uh, the correct stuff that is being deployed onto the cluster uh, the example that you gave you know the uh, nginx or the malware nginx so it is deploying the right uh, image and the right things and then it deploys no change done as such on the application side of things so application side of things and the container images remains the same only changes being done is the a way we create the VMs using natively like this, or uh, there is a Cocoa operator as well that you can use if you are, if you want to configure on your own the, or you are doing it on a self-managed kind of cluster, or you want to manually connect it and do some stuff, some fun stuff, uh, the hard way kind of thing. You can do the Cocoa operator, um, and internally, I I don't know if as you might be using Cocoa operator internally to kind of you know spin up things or making it work and stuff like that but yeah you can use the uh, coco operator as well to configure the things yeah perfect summary again <laughs> yeah i was just trying to understand if i am correct in this particular scenario no, uh, but yeah yes. and I'm, I'm, I'm impressed you you do these summaries really uh, on point uh, i'm really <laughs> glad you do those <laughs> uh yeah this this helps because i don't want you know, uh, if I'm able to understand and if I'm not able to understand, so it would give audience the gist, okay, yes, this is how this is going and this is what should have been understood and what should have been communicated. If there is a gap, then yes, you correct me. Okay, no, this this is not what I was, what I meant, but it was the other way around. Another question is um, on the Kubelet side of things and on the um, Kubernetes component side of things, mm -hmm. um, when I, I still... I'm trying to understand, but not not fully, uh, you know, understood that part. How currently, like currently, when you say we have created a confidential VM, like we added the node with the runtime class, we created a confidential VM. How is it a confidential VM when the core Kubernetes components, the CNI and all that stuff, is able to communicate with the control plane components, which is non-isolated and non-confidential? Yes. Um... Very good aspect uh, because um, that really needs to, needs to, needs needs to be clear. Um, so this Kubernetes cluster here, this AKS cluster, contrast demo cluster, um, it's Kubernetes nodes. They are just general VMs. No confidential computing involved so far. Um, so uh, all of the, um, the the Kubernetes node itself and the the components inside, like the kubelet or on the on the control plane side, the API server, they are not isolated or protected or, any, or anything other than the usual things. So Azure potentially has full access to, to any of this. Um, let me go back to the slides. Um, so this is our world in this case, right? So that's our node, that's our AKS uh, Kubernetes node. Um, red here means, um, untrusted in the sense there's no confidential computing involved. The 
uh, where, where we apply confidential computing is that we create these uh, pods, only the pods inside confidential Kata VMs. So only the Kata VM for the pod is a confidential VM, um, uh, meaning that um, the components that, I, that are not shown here, right, the kubelet, the container D, runtime, and so forth, um, they are all untrusted. Their only job is to create this pod VM, if you want to call it like that, uh, as a confidential VM. Um, and then in here, this is the, the trusted world. Anything that runs inside this pod VM is the is a trusted world. And if I go into the details, right, in this trusted world, uh, what's running is a small microkernel that's just necessary because we're running inside the VM. Um, um, some, some, some agent code, as you correctly uh, ex uh, just explained, is communicating um, with the kubelet and the outside world. And and it our container image uh, essentially. Um, so yeah, um, this is really essential. Only our container is 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 inside, and only this green box is is what's being protected and isolated. And this is why we need to do, um, or why I try to explain the necessity for um, doing this uh, runtime policy stuff, because we need to have a sort of isolation or sort of protection between us and the untrusted Kubernetes node and the untrusted kubelet and the untrusted um, uh, yeah, Kata shim uh, that's outside of the of the green box here. Awesome. Understood. Yeah, I think now it makes complete sense. Um, and um, yeah, to, just because this is a something I observed in the past a lot is um, this notion of verification, since this is something fairly, mm, um, yeah, that's not something that's commonly or a very common thing in, in, in let's say, in the, the, in the security world, um, and it's a fairly unique feature to confidential computing. It, it, it usually takes a bit of time to, to wrap your head around. Um, so if just there's somebody sitting and, and, and wondering, why are we doing all of this shenanigans? Um, this attestation part is really essential for most use cases, since most use cases are saying um, you cannot run this in the cloud, um, or I don't want to run this in the cloud because I don't trust the infrastructure, or because compliance or whatever is telling me, no, no, you need to have this uh, in your on-prem environment. Um, this attestation, this verification is the key feature that allows us to say there, um, say the there's the processor. We need we trust the processor, but we always trust the processor if it's on-prem or the cloud, doesn't matter. We trust the processor. Um, so this is our trust anchor, and only based on what the processor is telling us, we can say that's that's an isolated environment in the cloud. And on this abstract level, I've explained this initially, if we pull this into this confidential containers world, what we need to do is we need to say, yeah, this is a confidential container that runs inside a Kata micro VM, protected in this case by an AMD CPU, and it contains exactly that. And exactly that means it contains this kernel, it contains this agent, and it contains this container image. And we can verify the kernel and we can verify the agent based on the image, right? This Kata micro VM has also some VM image that it's running. We can verify this on the image. And this image is part of the um, what the what the processor is providing us with as uh, at the station information. Um, but we need to extend this also to the container itself. So we can say, as I explained, and as, as you correctly summarized, uh, this is actually an engine's running. And that's where runtime policies come into play. That we say, yeah, this is a kernel. Uh, sorry, this is a cut, confidential cutter VM with this kernel, this agent. This agent is enforcing this policy. And since uh, we know what the policy says, the policy says only run nginx. Uh, we can infer that, yeah, this is a confidential container running nginx. Um, I'm just trying to, to repeat this because it's really such an important aspect of confidential computing is this attestation part that is the foundation for really uh, making the use cases possible for, mo for most use cases that we want to do with this technology. Awesome. Cool. Uh, I think that was a really fantastic demo, uh, demo um, Moritz. So, and you really went from the scratch 
to deploying end to end an application which was not changed inside a Kubernetes cluster running as confidential uh, containers as the Kata container VMs, uh, which are the actual ones that gets, uh, you know, isolated from the rest of the workloads running inside the same node. Um, yeah, cool. Any Anything else um, you want to share? No, just, uh, you, yeah, I just want to say everything we, we, we showed, um, you will you will find in, in the links. Um, and I can just encourage you if you want to try this out or uh, if you want to deep dive deeper into this, uh, first of all, join the Confidential Containers community, right? This is here, the GitHub link and yeah, the link to the CNCF uh, project site. Um, there's a Slack community. I guess that's also a good starting point. There are a bunch of uh, meetings. There's the regular meeting and for all of the sub project, there are meetings. So this is really where you can join and get involved and, and, and the community is really looking for people. Um, um, either from contributing side, but also from just a use case side, or um, uh, if you have questions, uh, I think it always helps. Um, pr just providing questions helps to see how do people understand this concept. And yeah, everything else, um, you find the links. Um, if you want to repeat this example, um, I guess the best starting point uh, is go to the contrast, uh, getting started, um, create an AKS cluster, follow the steps. Um, and if there are any questions, uh, again, um, either uh, directly interact through GitHub, uh, through issues, uh, through discussions, or um, yeah, you, you you have my contact details, or uh, Siam's contact details, so please just get in touch. Awesome. Uh, so yeah, um, thank you so much, uh, Moritz, for, for your time and the detailed workshop on confidential computing. I, uh, I'll put all the links that were mentioned during this particular workshop in the description of the video. I just need one thing from all of you. Uh, if you have learned something from the workshop, do tag uh, Moritz and follow Moritz and uh, share your learnings, like what you learned in form of blogs, in form of tweets, in form of Twitter threads, in form of LinkedIn posts, uh, in form of X posts, in form of comments on, on YouTube, whatever and wherever you feel like doing it, just tag uh, him and Cube Simplify um, and what you learned from this particular workshop and try out confidential computing, uh, although it's not new, but it's picking up pace very fast now. Uh, so I think it's very right time to get involved in the communities if you want to come uh, contribute as well. So yes, and one last thing, obviously, make sure to subscribe to Cube Simplify so that I can keep bringing these amazing workshops uh, to you uh, and share it within your network. The replay will be available as soon as I end the stream. So uh, feel free to share the stream uh, with you, within your networks and also with your learnings. Uh, that's pretty much it. Um, thank you so much for watching and see you in the next workshop some other time. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs>